Uh, we've reached the end of our uh, Holy Week sermon series on the seven last words of Jesus. Uh, today, as we uh, go into Luke chapter 23, where he, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I think it's a great way of kind of ending uh, this sermon series. It seems like the very last thing that Jesus actually says. Uh, timing of some of these other ones is a little hard, because each, uh, each gospel account gives us something a little different. Hopefully you can join us tomorrow morning as well at 10.45 a.m. Uh, for Easter as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Uh, so hopefully you can join it, but this is our one last sermon. Uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, welcome back to the final uh, sermon in our series, The Seven Last Words of Jesus. Uh, I really have enjoyed, I'm so thankful for the different guys that have uh, shared the different passages. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really an encouragement to me. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. If you've missed any, go back and watch them. Uh, but we are at what I, I think most probably is the very, very last thing uh, that Jesus says. Uh, it probably comes right after uh, Jesus made that you know, final cry out of Tetelestai, uh, it is finished. And what he probably said right after that uh, is this phrase that we see found in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, crying out with a loud voice. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <clears throat> and having said this, he breathed his last breath. And maybe in some of your translations you see that he gave up the ghost. Um, the idea there is that breath and spirit are all really the same word there. Uh, the idea of uh, when our spirit leaves with our breath. Uh, now, just a couple, um, just make sure we understand this passage as well as we possibly can. He is quoting here. Uh, from Psalms chapter 31, verse 5, that into your hands I commit my spirit was said by David in a different circumstance. And Jesus uh, jumped on that phrasing, something that uh, people very knowledgeable in Scripture would have uh, connected. And he, he uses this kind of final words to quote Scripture, showing the connection uh, that he has had with the entire Bible, old and new. Uh, this is not something that Jesus is out of nowhere, unexpected. He is a fulfillment of everything that has come before. There is one story uh, going from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And uh, Jesus is the, the crescendo of that story. Now, the idea of to commit something or commend something, again, depending on your translation, uh, it's the idea of placing in front of. Uh, that was used uh, in when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. He, he uses the same Greek word there. He says, hey, commit that bread in front of them. Put that, place that bread in front of the people. He knows they're hungry. They collect the five loaves of bread, tear it into pieces, give it to each, and they place it in front of each person. All right, so that's the word that's being used there. And this is what he's saying. He is placing his spirit in front of the Father. All right, he knows that God is surely going to take uh, that spirit. He's going to protect it. It's this idea of uh, I'm entrusting this uh, to someone. I'm giving this to someone to take care of it. And so this is what Jesus is doing. And really, this is the model that he is showing of what we should do, that we too are laying our spirit in front of Jesus for him to take care of it, for him to protect it, for him to take it into his presence. Uh, this, this final line of Jesus here, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is, has been quoted by several people as their last words. Uh, we see even in Scripture, in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, when Stephen, the first martyr, all right, Stephen was one of the seven, um, he's one of the seven deacons, that was chosen for the church. They, they didn't even use that term yet. They were just called the seven. And uh, they were just meant to serve the church, take care of uh, the widows, the orphans, especially the Gentile widows. 
but he gets caught up in a crowd and they are riled up and they start stoning him. Paul is there collecting people's cloaks so they can uh, better throw rocks at him. And uh, his final line here is he sees heaven open up. Uh, he says uh, there in Acts 7.59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. All right, so he, he certainly takes the same concept of asking the Lord, please take my spirit, welcome my soul into heaven. Uh, but this has also been said by Polycarp. He was the disciple of John, uh, St. Augustine, St. Bernard, John Huss, uh, Jerome of Prague, Luther, and even Christopher Columbus. Uh, his final words on his deathbed were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I think the other thing I want to point out here is that uh, the, the different gospel writers that record uh, this statement, here we see specifically in Luke said, having said this, he breathed his last breath or, or gave up the ghost. None of the uh, gospel writers choose the words like he died and then he died. Uh, and, and I think that's purposeful. Uh, I think that is reflecting what Jesus said in John 10, 18, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay my life down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. So Jesus has been foreshadowing in his teachings to the disciples that, yeah, nobody, nobody's going to take my life. No one's going to murder me. I lay down my life. Again, we want to make the distinction. Jesus isn't committing suicide, okay? He isn't committing suicide. He has simply allowed himself to be taken into the hands of his enemies, knowing what his enemies are going to do with him. And we also want to make sure we don't swing to the other side. This is not unexpected. We've seen this in several of the statements that Jesus makes. This is as prophecy has foretold, this is as Jesus has warned his disciples that he is going to be killed. All right, but this is not something that it is this unknown action that's about to occur. Wow, I didn't realize it would get this crazy. I didn't realize it would get to this point. Jesus 100% knew what was going to happen to him if he allowed himself to be taken into custody at the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what was going to happen to him if he was going through trial with Caiaphas and Annas, what was going to happen with the trial at Herod and Pilate. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what the end result was going to be, and he allowed it. And I think this phrasing of, you know, into your, into your hands I commit my spirit, breathing his last breath, is showing that they couldn't actually kill him if he didn't let them. You know, Jesus would have the ability to still be on that cross right here and now. He could still be that symbol 2,000 years later on that cross showing that no one can kill me. I am undefeatable. Uh, that wasn't the message that Jesus was trying to preach. He was going to die, to beat the one thing we all thought was truly undefeated, death itself. Jesus defeats sin. He defeats death there on the cross. He reveals his power over what would seemingly be the most powerful thing in our lives, the thing we fear the most. All right? And so here it reflects back how we can see that, no, I lay down my life, but don't forget he also says, and I have the right to take it up again. I think one of the things we were supposed to think of, uh, an illustration of the cross, goes all the way back uh, to our forefather Abraham, where Abraham was asked to bring his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah, where, most likely at least, where Jerusalem was, very close to where uh, Jesus was being crucified. And so G Abraham brings his son up to that mountain, where sacrifices have now been taking place for 2,000 years in Jewish history. Uh, and he is asked to sacrifice his one and only son. We, 
we get this story. It's a horrible story. We don't like that God asked Abraham to do this. We don't like that Abraham was actually about to do it. We don't like anything about this story. Uh, but it gives us this great visceral uh, reaction. It, it puts it in a context we understand that we see a father who loves his son and is about to sacrifice. We even see a son kind of inexplicably trusting his father and is willing to go through whatever the father wants him to go through. This is a 12-year-old boy. He's starting to ask the great questions like, where's the sacrifice? And he's being asked to lay down on this altar. You know, he his, his dad's like 100 plus years old. If this 12-year-old wanted to get away from 100-year-old Abraham, he probably could have. We, we see this, this foreshadow playing out in this story. But then we love it as Abraham is about to stab his son. There's this voice, stop, stop. And we're, we're, we take that sigh of relief. Like, Good, I don't know how I would have interpreted this story if Abraham actually kills his son. Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed God so much that he even believed that God could raise his son from the dead. He was going to kill his son. But fortunately, God intervened. He had the authority to stop Abraham. But nobody has the authority to stop God the Father. And when the Father intended on punishing his son, as, as Jesus becomes sin personified, as he takes on the sins of the world, there is no one that is able to or has the authority to stop the Heavenly Father, from going through the punishment that sin absolutely deserves. And Jesus is taking that punishment that we absolutely deserved to endure. Jesus took it in our place. Jesus is that willing sacrifice that he is allowing the Father to pour out his wrath on him. We see this Heavenly Father destroying sin there on the cross and in at the same time destroying his one and only son and this is why the the cross is the worst event imaginable it's the worst event imaginable because here's this good person that's being punished you know any other time where we hear stories of maybe an innocent person suffering those are terrible stories we we have a justice system that at least claims to say that we would rather let you know a hundred guilty people go free than have one innocent person punished. We have this mentality, whether we're living that out all the time, and the justice system is another uh, another discussion. Uh, but the idea is right, that we, we don't want an innocent person to suffer. That's horrible. That, that's horrible. And this is why the cross is so horrible. Because even if I were to go to prison for something I didn't actually do, I'm still an evil, bad person. And so the punishment, although might not fit the crime, isn't to really an innocent person. I'm not innocent. All right? I am a sinner. Jesus was innocent. He was good. The only person that can actually make that claim that he was a good person. It's the most horrible event in history because where you, you would ask me, do I... Do I want to die on a cross? No, that's a horrible way to die. Like, firing squad, get your head chopped off. That's quick. That's painless. Crucifixion is meant to inflict pain. It is meant to be horrific. All right, but I will tell you the one instance in which I say, crucify me. And it's, it's if the option is you either you are going to face that crucifixion or one of your children. Sicily, Venice, Roman, they are going to be crucified. I'll be like, crucify me. Because the only thing worse than me being crucified is seeing one of my kids being crucified. Uh, yeah, no, no. I, I, that, my heart would explode. I wouldn't be able to take it. Understand what's happening at the cross. In that moment, God is on that cross. God, who became a human being, that can experience all the things that we can experience and he experienced the horrific pain of the cross. He experienced what death on a cross truly was. But at the same time, God is looking at his one and only son. 
God is looking down from heaven and seeing his perfect, innocent son being crucified. This is why it's the worst event in history. It's the worst event in history. But what we have during Easter here is that we see something that seems so horrible, that seems so irredeemable, becomes the most important day in history when three days from now, Jesus is going to rise from the dead, beating sin and beating death, and awaits in heaven, ready to prepare a place for anybody who believes and trusts in him. This is how God can turn something that seems only bad and turn it into what could only be described as the greatest moment in history. Uh, what a difference a couple days can make. But this is what the power of God does. He takes something horrible and he can turn it into something great. So let me just remind us, I've said these things throughout, but we have two applications that I want to bring out to you this evening. Number one, understand uh, what you are doing in salvation that you are putting your soul in the hands of someone you trust. When we talk about salvation, belief, trusting in God, trusting in Jesus, and even phrases that maybe I don't like as much of just accepting Jesus into your heart, whatever term that you're used to, what you're essentially saying is, I am not going to try to get saved on my own. I'm not going to try to earn my place in heaven. I recognize I can't, and it's actually offensive if I try. I am going to take my soul, my spirit, the one eternal thing about me, and I'm going to hand it to someone that I trust. I'm going to hand it to the only person I would entrust with my eternal soul, and that is Jesus. And I think application number two tells us why uh, that that makes sense. I think application number two is we can see that no one was capable of defeating Jesus. No one was capable of stopping Jesus. No one is capable of thwarting Jesus. Anything that Jesus does on the cross is because he willingly laid down his life. He died willingly in our place. All right, It's one thing to tell you that he loves you that he's going to take care of your soul, that he will entrust your, you know, he will take that soul and bring it to heaven. Uh, and that's where you'll spend all eternity. It's one thing to tell you that. And it's another thing to show you that. And that is what Jesus does on the cross is he shows us. He shows us what dependency on God looks like. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He does that to the Father. We then see he dies, and we're like, oh, it, it, is it over? Did, it, were we wrong? Is he not the Messiah? So then three days later, he raises from the dead, and now we can see, okay, okay, he defeated sin. He defeated death. Oh, If I'm going to trust my soul to anybody, it's going to be to the person that showed his love for me. That showed he has the power over sin. That showed what it means to trust God and that we too can trust God as well. It's why death doesn't have a sting anymore. It can't scare us the way it used to. I'm not saying death isn't scary at all. It definitely just cannot scare us as much as it used to. This unknown it's a little more known. You know, one thing we know about death is that death could not contain Jesus. It tried. It could not. It failed. And it will fail with us too. Because if we have a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is now given to us. God's very spirit is now linked with our spirit. And we can know for sure that God's Spirit is going to be spending an eternity in heaven, the Holy Spirit is God, is going to be spending an eternity in heaven, and our spirit is linked with that. We have handed our soul to God, and we are entrusting Him with it. And that is the wisest decision you could ever make. If there's any more, uh, if there's any more conversation you need to have 
on when it comes to trusting Jesus as your Savior, what it really means to believe in Him. You put a comment in the message below. You message me. You message the church. I'd love to reach out and have a more personal conversation with you uh, if you'd like. Uh, but I'd love everyone to join me in prayer. Uh, Jesus, we are just so thankful for the work that you have done on the cross. We are so thankful for the punishment that you paid in our stead. Jesus, we trust you and in you alone with the most precious thing, the only eternal thing that we have in our life, our soul, our spirit. And we want to entrust it to you. We want to commend our spirit to you, commit our spirit to you. You hold on to it. You take care of it. You bring it to heaven with you, God. We have no capability of doing this on our own. And we trust you and in you alone to save us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for you that you keep your promises. Thank you for not just telling us what you can do and what you're capable of and how much you love us, but by showing us. And we, we did not miss that message uh, that you showed us, Lord. So we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We honor you in every which way we know how. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, we hope you'll join us tomorrow morning, 10.45 a.m. I believe we actually have a 10 a.m. Uh, service for the kids. Uh, we're going to be going through the resurrection eggs. They're, they're playing a little game. I think you've seen maybe on our Facebook page from Pastor Jason. That's at 10 a.m. And then at 10.45 a.m. our Easter service will begin. We hope you can join us. Uh, we hope you um, can bring your whole family around and watch at the same time everybody else is watching. Awesome. Talk to you soon.